That's a good song, isn't it? I like that song. I think Janelle picked that out a couple of years ago. Anyway, I'd like to read from Psalm 9, verses 1 and 2. And uh, may this be a prayer upon our hearts this morning as we gather. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Uh, Let's stand for a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for these scriptures, and we thank you for being so, so very good to us. We thank you for your great, great love. And it's our prayer that we would be thankful with all of our hearts, that we would sing and exalt uh, the God of our salvation this morning and that we would just heap praise upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that we would do this in spirit and in truth and that we just wouldn't uh, go through the motions or uh, give lip service this morning. Uh, And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Uh, God bless you for being here at this hour this day uh, uh, on a brisk day. Uh, we were talking this morning about, right, Sandy, about how, how everything hurts, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I don't know where to start. But anyway, I do know where to start. Please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done so already. I greatly appreciate that. Um, all right, so um, no visitors this morning? Okay, so uh, we have prayer and Bible study on Wednesday night. We're in James chapter 3. James has a tremendous amount to say about the tongue. Uh, oh my goodness, the tongue. Uh, uh, it's huge, so that's what we're going to be looking at uh, this upcoming week. week. And uh, uh, encourage you to that study if you have the schedule. Uh, also, we have discipleship class after the morning service in the other building. Uh, last night we had our annual uh, business meeting and potluck supper. Uh, we appreciate those who set up uh, and we're able to be in attendance and supportive uh, of that time. Um, Sandy has copies of the new budget. No. Oh, you don't? No, I have to change things. So I oh, don't okay. Have time yet. So do we have a. Last year's. Oh, last year's. I'm sorry. Okay. Budget to okay, great. All right. So uh, last year's budget is on the table, and hopefully we have the new budget for next year, yes. right? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Alice Perry is a shut-in uh, in her late 90s, and uh, there's a notation here. She got a birthday uh, uh, in a couple, uh, next week, actually, a week from tomorrow, and uh, you're encouraged to send a card to her. Also, I want you to know, uh, coming off the uh, annual business meeting last night, so we have about $20,500 that uh, still needs to be paid to the bank. The Finance Committee will be paying uh, $10,000 to reduce that. And so we'll, um, we've already paid that actually, right, Sandy? So we have 10500 Right. Uh, we are still taking, I just want people to know that we are still taking donations uh, for that fund, okay? And you'll find envelopes on the back table in the foyer if you're led and able to do so. Um, and I think that covers everything that I want to mention. Is there anything else this morning for the good of the congregation? Anything else? Okay. Um, so I'm not a song leader. Uh, the Ganaways are in Florida as well as the Hurleys. Uh, th- you know, that's an idea, right folks? Uh, but uh, not a song leader, but um, uh, I will announce the next song and it's a good one. Um, I want to count our blessings uh, uh, but come, come thou every fount of blessing, uh, number 11. Uh, please stand.
Our offering uh, thought today, our offertory thought today, comes out of Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 12. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Uh, it's my prayer for me and every one of us that we would learn that as well. Uh, Bob and Drew, please come forward. Bob, would you be good enough to lead us in prayer today? Generally, Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your love. Pray that you'll take this offering which we're about to receive and use it for the furtherance of your work. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. May be seated. Oh, actually, um, we have a missions moment, Jackie, right? I forgot about that. I knew that before I came up here, but I forgot about it. So you're going to share with us? Yes. Did you want to come up here? Or you just want to no, share? I'll go for Would you like a microphone? No. I don't okay. Well. Okay. Um, I'm going to share with you about Camp Fireside that we've been supporting for uh, several years. It's a camp in uh, Rochester, it's, they have a property, 186 acres in Rochester and Barrington, New Hampshire. Um, <coughs> their main focus is to develop character and the kids that go there and to promote a lifestyle that's based on biblical principles. Um, it was established in 1952 as a non-denominational.
Nice to see that God has you know, raised them up uh, from the ashes, so to speak. Uh, and the other thing I was struck with, too, not only your research, Jackie, with that, but, you know, those two ladies, they're long gone, but what God laid upon their heart and that ministry still continues. And what a great blessing. Uh, it's just how God works things out, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, before we uh, uh, go to the Lord in prayer, uh, what is on your heart? Uh, who would you like to pray for? What would you like to pray for? Uh, I'd like to open it up to a time of prayer. Certainly, we want to pray for Camp Fireside. Um, you know, Mickey, Jerry, uh, Hartgrove, uh, Dave, uh, Edie Jackson, just to name a few. Um, Rose. Rose, yeah, thank you, Rose. Um, um, what's that? Keith. Oh, Keith. Yeah, Keith's right up there. Keith. Uh, hi, Keith. Uh, Keith, uh, so Keith still has, uh, a, is it right to say, Keith, you have an open wound on the foot and is still trying to heal? Yes. Okay, so a couple stitches kind of came out, and I don't know if Keith was, you know, a bad boy to make that happen, yes. or Keith was a bad... <laughs> Keith was a bad boy to make that happen. Uh, I'm a guy. I understand that stuff. So anyway, but um, so he needs some sort of procedure or process to try to um, facilitate healing, whether it's uh, um, there's a couple things that he shared with me the other day through a text. So uh, pray that uh, that happens and there's no more problems with that foot. Um, anybody else? Any, anything else? Hi, Paula. Hi. Um, my daughter, Laura Amanda, she needed to heal. They put her on breast for about a week. So I'm going to pray for her. Okay, right. She had the surgery right here. Right. Right. Okay. Um, and then also, I should mention, we welcome folks from Camp Fireside. Uh, right. Right. Okay. Uh, also, I should mention, we welcomed four new members uh, last night, uh, uh, Rick and Paula, and Janice Barry. She's not here because her grandkids came down with the flu, and she was thoughtful enough not to potentially bring it in here, and then Barbara McCoy. So we welcome, uh, yeah. Okay, um, pray as you feel led, anything else that the Lord lays upon your heart, I'll close in prayer. Amen. And so, I don't like the amount of time that he has been gone from you, but that's not eternity. This is not his home, and you have a much greater picture and vision and vantage point than I could ever have. Mm -hmm. And so, I thank you, God, that I know that you're a good God, mm -hmm. and you're going to remain a good father to Mm -hmm. Amen.
Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Father, we continue to pray for Dave and his treatments. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just pray that you will continue to give him physical strength and mental and emotional and spiritual strength to get through this difficult time. And Father, we just thank you for his family and the support that they've provided for him. And we pray that that tumor would continue to shrink and that he would be able to have it removed and uh, just get beyond this and be able to get back to joining us at church and getting back to his regular activities, Lord. And Father, I also think of Rose. I thank you that she's making progress at the rehab, and I just pray that um, she will get stronger and be able to get back to All-American. And Lord, I also just um, bring Edie Jackson before you. I thank you for the time that I was able to spend with her the other day, and I just um, thank you especially for her, her good and positive attitude, Lord, her upbeat uh, presence of mind, and I just pray that that would continue and that you would uh, continue to encourage her heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Anybody else? Heavenly Father, uh, we have come here this morning and have gathered because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our hearts, and we believe that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to you uh, except through him. Uh, we thank you uh, for the gospel of Christ. We thank you for the word of God, which stands forever. Uh, and Lord, as I prayed this morning and last night and even in the prayer closet, thank you for the way in which you shepherd me and uh, how you shepherd your people. Uh, you're so, so patient and so good and merciful and loving kind. Uh, your ways are way way better and way higher than our ways and your thoughts way better and higher than our thoughts and uh, we praise God for that um, Father I, I think of Barbara's prayer for the unsaved in her family and I think Cindy alluded to that as well and all of us can relate to that uh, we, have, uh, we have loved ones that are unsaved and we pray 
through another's testimony, through our testimony, uh, that, that they would be moved uh, to give their hearts to you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would go after them and open the eyes of their hearts and that the, the scales would fall off and they would see the glory of Christ and their need for him. And uh, so we lift up all of the unsaved in our families uh, that you would uh, minister to their hearts and that you would reach out to their hearts. Uh, Father, I echo the prayers uh, of Keith for his son. Uh, we thank you for Sam, and we know that you're going to visit with him, and we know that you're going to uh, turn his heart around, and we know that you're going to uh, compromise and uh, stymie uh, those that have been the enemies of his soul. Uh, and we thank you in advance uh, for what you're going to do and when you're going to do that. We know that you haven't forgotten Sam, and so I lift him up and pray uh, that, that you would visit with him, and we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Um, we pray that you would minister to Amanda and Dave and Edie and Jerry and Mickey and Rose and, and all of their emotional and mental and spiritual and physical needs. And we also pray that uh, you would touch Keith's foot uh, that he would find uh, complete healing and give the doctors wisdom for whatever process um, they need uh, or technique they need uh, to be able uh, to accomplish that. Um, I pray for continued healing for um, uh, the cancer that was removed from Mim's face and also Carl's face. And um, pray, Lord, uh, this morning, too, that uh, as we gather... Um, that you um, would, would, would touch our hearts, our minds, our bodies in such a way uh, where we feel better as we leave this place and that you would especially um, visit each area uh, of our uh, individual hearts um, and uh, speak to our hearts and minister to our hearts in such a way where we know that we've been with you. I also pray uh, for traveling mercies for the Hurleys and for the Ganaways. Uh, thank you for what they mean to our church, and we pray that you would get them home uh, uh, safely. And I also pray for traveling mercies for my son, Brett, uh, as he comes home later this week. Uh, we want to give you uh, all the praise and the honor and the glory, and we thank you again for the answered prayer um, and how you're going to answer these prayers in your time and in your way. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, scripture reading. Uh, Drew? First scripture reading today is from... Book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses, excuse me, Book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. And that is on page 884 in the Church Bible. Matthew 21, 28 through 32, page 884. <coughs> Excuse me, page 885. <laughs> but what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. The man came to the second and said the same thing, and he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward so as to believe him. Thanks, Drew. Uh, our next song...
Second scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30, and that starts on page 889 in the church Bible. Matthew 25, 14 through 30, page 889. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey, who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them, The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him, and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has more, excuse me, for to everyone who has, more shall be given. And he will have an abundance, but from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Father, uh, thank you for your word. Thank you that it doesn't return void. Uh, We give you this time, uh, uh, all that I am. Uh, I pray that you use my heart, my mind, my hands, my feet, uh, my spirit uh, to be a blessing to your people. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, um, according to Nerd Wallet, um, that's an online thing that tells you what you can do with your money. Uh, the seven best investments right now in 2024 are high yield savings accounts, CDs, bonds, funds, like that'd be mutual funds and index funds and one kind of other fund, I think, stocks. Alternative investments and cryptocurrencies, and real estate. Now, I don't think they order them in any particular order of lesser to greater or greater to lesser. But they go on to talk about how investing um, pays off later. Now, I'm not an investing guru. Uh, I know very, very little about the markets and investing. I I try to read up on things and stay informed. What I do know is this. Wherever you put your money, you want to try to stay ahead of the inflation rate. Because if you don't, then you're actually losing money. But after, (laughs) after reading this article, my first response is like, what are these people smoking? You, You tell me, is there any safe haven? in which to put your hard-earned money? 
Not under this administration, certainly not. The global elites are downsizing America. Um, a lot of your big companies are laying off. Yeah, you probably watch the news, right? I am here to tell you that the only safe haven that ever was, always will be, and forever will be, is when we invest in the kingdom of heaven and in the kingdom of God. All of this stuff here will fly away or you're going to leave it to somebody else, as King Solomon says. The only safe investment that always has, always will be, and forever will be is the investment into God's kingdom. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Uh, the parable of the talents here teaches us to invest in God's kingdom. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ it, it encourages each and every person to do that. And I will tell you that God will always give you a fair measure of investment and return. He's the fairest person in the universe, and he will deliver. It's a rich investment. He promises it to be a safe investment and a good investment and an eternal investment, and it's not going to rust and fade away or fly away. You can take a look at your monthly you know, 401k statement or your IRAs or whatever investments you have, and you say, where did it all go? <laughs> right? Oh, my goodness. Up and down, up and down, up and down. You know, years ago, I got to tell you, I, I went to this seminar up in Franklin, and uh, the sales pitch was to get a tenfold ROI that's return on investment, ROI, right? A tenfold return on your investment. So I'm sitting in a place of about 50 to 100 people, and I, like, I raise my hand, and it's like, how much is it going to cost? He would never tell me, or the 50 to 100 people there, how much it was going to cost if he was going to give you a tenfold return on your ROI, and he would dance around the subject, and I read, but how much is it going to cost? And then when he turned around and said, like, if you, if you, if you want to know what it costs, I'm not telling you, he says, anybody can leave right now. So I got up and I left. <laughs> God tells you that he's going to give you a great return on your investment. And for some, it's a hundredfold. That's a great investment, right? When somebody doesn't want to uh, tell you what the cost is, buyer beware. I'm here to tell you that God will always take what we give him. Be it little or great, he will take what you are willing to give him to invest in his kingdom. And the return will be always way better than the world. And I can tell you also that God will never disappoint you. I think most of you know that. Now, I, I want to I put this parable in its context, and um, that's really, really important to do. This, is, this parable falls in the context of the Olivet Discourse. This is a prophetic discourse, and this actually uh, happened where Jesus was sitting uh, up on the Mount of Olives. Uh, this past week, I, I got a little joke to my phone. Uh, where did Jesus go for a snack? Anybody? Mount Olive. <laughs> anyway. But he's sitting up on Mount Olive. And the disciples, you know, they walked by all the buildings out of the city... And they were marveling at all the buildings. And, and Jesus starts to talk about some end time stuff. Let's, let's kind of enumerate here. He talks about the destruction of the third temple. You had Solomon's temple. They tried, uh, they, the people that returned from captivity tried to rebuild it. We have Herod's temple, which is essentially, you know, uh, a rebuilding, uh, a better rebuilding of Solomon's. And then, then you will have... The, the third temple that has to be rebuilt, and then we'll ultimately have a millennial temple. But we have the destruction of the third temple. 
Jesus talks about perilous times that are coming. We're already seeing that, right? But it's going to get worse. He speaks of the abomination of desolation by Antichrist. He tells the parable of the fig tree, which, by the way, is a reference to the nation Israel. I, I think it was Kim who prayed for Israel this morning. Pray for Israel. Uh, she's up against it. And notice else what he mentions. You've got to trust me on this here. He talks about watchfulness. In the last two days of Jesus' life, he talked about being watchful to his disciples seven times over. And then it's in that context here that we have the parable of the ten virgins, we have the parable of the talents. You okay, Jackie? You sure? Okay. I have a mint in the closet you can have. Oh, you got one? Okay. All right. So we have, we have the, the parable of the talents. We have the, um, um, the, the ten, parable of the ten virgins. And then we have the separation of the, the sheep and goats. Now, there's all sorts of ways that people want to parse this. You know, they want to talk about how these parables are related to Israel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I am suggesting to you that this is more of a general overview. God is the master of the universe. He's the master of the household, so to speak, from top to bottom, the world. And in his absence, this is, I think, a picture. These parables are a picture of how people are going to fall out. They're going to, some are going to have oil in their lamps and some are not. And some are going to be faithful and invest eternally and some are not. And what we have here is the, the, the separation of the, sheeps and the, the sheep and the goats. You know, the believers and the unbelievers. And I think that that's how we should understand this. Could it be related to Israel? Perhaps. But I think it's more of a general view of what's going to take place during the time that Christ is absent. And so the parables about stewardship and it's investing in God's kingdom in his absence. And when we do that, that's a picture of belief. When we take what God has given to us and we invest, only believers do that. And the unbeliever and what the unbelievers what they do is they bury it because they don't believe. Now this is, this is about laying up treasures in heaven, and it's more about money. Uh, it's, it's money, but it's, it's more about time and energy and natural gifts and spiritual gifts and things. And it's all about taking it and using it to the glory of God. That's stewardship. Now, I want you to notice that there were two faithful servants in the parable and one unfaithful servant. Do you know that the word for faith or faithful, is also to believe. And so it, it, the word faithful comes from the word belief. And it implies that two were believing, they invested. They saw the value of it. They saw the purpose of it. They understood the importance of it. And now you have un, the unfaithful one, that's unbelief. They were worthless. They didn't see anything, uh, and no importance, no value, no nothing to it. And that, and, and that implies that they were an unbeliever. Now, I, I want to give you a, a kind of just a, a reminder about how we look at parables and how we interpret parables. A parable always has a central spiritual theme. There's all sorts of details to a parable, but that's kind of window dressing to round out a story. But you always look for a central theme in a parable. And, and so, uh, and we're not supposed to go crazy with all the details and applying special meaning to it. So in this particular case, what one has been given is God-given, be it little or great. You know, we, 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 live, we see that people have more than others, and we see that people have less than others. It's not about how much you have and how less you have. It's about what you do with it when you have it. And so one can invest their life into the things of Christ and one can squander their life apart from Christ. Now I want you to notice that this is the parable of the talents and Jesus uses the word talent. And when we think of the word talent, we think of all the abilities that a person may have. 
That's not actually uh, the interpretation of the word, but that's how Jesus is actually using it. Uh, the word talent here refers to a large amount of money. Uh, probably we would want to say, you know, refer to it as wealth. We talk about large sums of money as wealth. As you know, money is used to buy stuff, and money is of importance and value. And so he uses the word talent to kind of bring it front and center with what people get and they have and they, you know, with, with, with their buying and their spending. Now, I came across this years ago, but somebody figured out what the equivalent of uh, what a talent would be. And a talent would be 6,000 denarii, and a, denar a denarius was one day's wage. So everyone here had a lot of money or got a lot of money or at least had a reasonable amount of wealth. So the one talent man at 6,000 day wages would be like close to 16 and a half years worth of income. If you take an average salary of 40,000 a year, we're looking at close to $660,000 that this one talent would have. So the people under, back then when Jesus told this parable, they understood that he was talking about vast sums of money or wealth. The two talent man, you just double it. It's 12,000 days wages. It's almost 33 years uh, worth of wages. And it's like uh, over $1.3 million equivalent today. And then the five talent would be 82, over 82 years worth of money, 30,000 days wages, and over uh, close to uh, $3.3 million. So Jesus is using this to get people's attention and to talk about the tremendous wealth. They're interesting tidbits, but he's going beyond actual money. It's the issue of stewardship. It's everything that we have. Everything that, that we buy, everything that we possess, everything that we are, everything that we could ever want to do or, or be. And, and, and if, you, if you really assess the parable, again, it's, it's not how much money one has or what's been given. It's an awful lot. And it's, it's not about having less or more. It's about doing something with it when it's been given to us. And you know that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And anything that we have in our bank account, we say it's ours, but it's ultimately his, right? Because he gave it to us. Yeah, we worked for it, but he gave us the health and wealth and strength to be able to work for it. And so it, it, it's all of these things. It's money, it's energy, it's strength, it's natural talents, spiritual gifts. Whatever is God given, that's the picture here. What I also see here too is opportunity. Opportunity is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And when opportunity knocks, some people recognize that opportunity and they jump into it. And other people, they never recognize the opportunity and they never jump in. And I think that's a huge part of, of what's happening here. And that lesson comes through when you take a look at the results. Regardless of having five or two talents, both of these in the parable, both of these people were praised for making the most of the opportunity. They were both promised that they would be given more, return ROI, return on investment, and they were both honored and told to enter into the joy of their master. They were believing, they were saved. They did something with Christ in their life. The one talented person was not praised, but reprimanded. He dug a hole and he buried it. He didn't invest. You know, um, remember back in the 30s after the Depression, uh, people would stuff their money in a mattress? It kind of worked because the banks failed. But today, with interest, I mean, I'm sorry, with the inflation, you're losing money ex you know, proportionally and exponentially. And I, I, was looking at, I was looking at this, I'm thinking, if the guy with the one talent actually invested it and made two, he too would have been honored and praised 
and took opportunity and, and would have, Jesus would have said, enter into the joy of your master. And, and of course, that obviously would change the whole nuance of the parable, right? But here's the other principle. Based on what Jesus taught, you have a kingdom law of increase and decrease. You know, and, and whatever people invest and give to God, he multiplies. And whatever you hold on to, somehow it seems to just vanish and go away. I've seen it happen. Not personally, but with people. They hold on to it, and then they lose it, and they don't have it, because they didn't use it to the glory of Christ. Now, here's the other thing I want to... Uh, observation I want to make. You know, you read this parable, and it's almost like everything gravitates toward the guy, you know, the one talent guy. He's almost kind of seems center stage here because he didn't invest and he didn't take the opportunity, and he wasn't a good steward. He didn't use, he abused. And I think herein lies the tragedy that's found in this parable. Uh, it's not that some were given more and made more, as I talked about. The tragedy is he did nothing with it. Uh, by the way, I was thinking, socialists and Marxists who read this parable, you know what they would say? Hey, the guy that made the five and got five more, and the guy that made, had the two and made two, give me some of your stuff. That's what they would say. You've got more, give me some of that stuff. And they would say, that's unfair. You need to share it and give it away. Uh, God's not unfair with what he does. And, and, and as I said to a family member, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago, they're socialists. I said, why don't you give away your stuff first rather than wanting to take my stuff and give it to other people who don't appreciate it and will use it, use it to abuse it? You know, let me decide what I want to do with my stuff and let me decide to internally invest in the kingdom of heaven and as I'm led by almighty God to do it with my stuff, what he's given me. But you know, that's, that's a Marxist mentality. And they'll say, well, you know, whatever you have, you know, you've got to give away. God says, whatever you have, invest in the kingdom of heaven. So, you know, I, 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 I'll, I'll invest in the kingdom of heaven, not in statism and collectivism, right? Here, here's, here's the big picture, folks. When God comes, there are two types of people. Those who gave to God and got a great return, and those who did not. Those who took action and those who did not, those who invested their wealth, their time, their stuff, their energy and talents into the kingdom of God, and those that did not. You know, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, like, if I'm sitting in the pew and, you know, I look at this from a perspective of my own life um, and other people's lives, they say, you know, well, God, like, I don't feel like I'm greatly talented, right? You know, maybe one gift. I'm the one gift guy, right? I'm not the two or the five or the ten or whatever. Maybe you feel like that. And I say, well, how could I ever invest? How could God ever use me? What could I give or what could he take from me? I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too rich, I'm not rich enough, I'm significant. How can I make a difference? And, you know, we could go on and on and on because this one guy found an excuse. He said, well, you know, I, I knew you were a hard man, God, you know, and uh, master, and, and uh, you know, I was really, really afraid. Right? And we were talking about fear and unbelief this morning in, in Sunday school. And so, uh, I want to share with you, uh, somebody gave me something over 23 years ago, and uh, I, I want to reshare it. 23 years ago, I'm sure most of you, some of you weren't even here, and most of you won't even remember anyway. But I, I will tell you that God will use any, anyone and anything to his honor and to his glory, okay? Let me give you a list. Noah was a drunk. Noah got drunk. God still used Noah. 
Abraham was old. God still used Abraham. Isaac, a daydreamer. Isaac lived a very quiet life. God used him, right? Jacob was a liar and a deceiver, a supplanter. <laughs> Leah was ugly and had bad eyesight. Joseph was abused. He was a slave and he spent time in prison. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. David had an affair and was a murderer. Timothy and Jeremiah were very young. Elijah was suicidal at one point. Isaiah preached naked, actually. He probably was down to his underwear. He wasn't totally naked, okay? Uh, Jonah ran from God. Naomi was an embittered widow. Ruth was a foreigner. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha worried about everything. Mary Magdalene, well, you know about Mary Magdalene. You have the Samaritan woman. She didn't have a husband. <laughs> no, actually, she was living with a guy. And she had, what, five husbands, right? Uh, and Zacchaeus, a runt, had to climb a tree. Paul was a murderer. He was arrogant. and He was super religious at the time that he was Saul. And God saved him. Timothy had an ulcer. Take a little wine for your stomach, Timothy. And Lazarus was dead. And all of those people, God used in some way, some form, some fashion to the glory of Christ and to God in his kingdom to save people. And you say, well, pastor, I'm, you know, I'm shut in and I'm, you know, I'm aching and I'm hurting. Yeah, I'm hurting too today. But, you know, you can pray. I mean, I remember Pastor Dow used to tell me, you know, they can take a lot of things away from me that can't take my ability to pray. There's ways that you can totally invest in the kingdom of God. And God will use it all. Amen? God's an equal opportunity employer. Uh, we're encouraged to invest and promote his kingdom. Each person has great opportunity. It's never too late to invest. God will always take what you have and what, you, what you're willing to give him. We're encouraged to be faithful. And we're all encouraged to go hard after the kingdom of God. Go hard after it and invest in it. And as, as for nerd wallet, forget what they said. They know nothing. All right? They never even mentioned the safest investment of all time, the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for the word of God that stands forever, and thank you for the challenge before us uh, to give of our life, our talents, our gifts, our money, uh, our stuff, all to the glory of Christ. And uh, thank you, Lord, that we can invest through prayer and just very, very little things, that insignificant things uh, that seemingly um, w would never even make a difference. And uh, we thank you that we can look at Holy Scripture and see all of the flawed people, uh, the, 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 the people that would seemingly amount to nothing, uh, all of their shortcomings, all of their sin, all of their failure, and yet how you're able to take them and use all them for the gospel and the glory of God to save souls. And we thank you uh, for the, the challenges we look at scripture. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to invest uh, and to invest, uh, to invest eternally. Uh, thank you for this time. We want to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our uh, closing song this morning is uh, 670, 670, Make Me a Blessing.